Welcome to the Social Impact Level Up podcast. This podcast is made from the spaces I host every week on the Clubhouse app in the Social Impact Level Up Club. If you don't know me, I'm Wendy V, and I am a coach for socially conscious entrepreneurs. I help you develop your social impact mission, clarify your vision, and turn your ideas into action. Every week, I talk to leaders with a social impact mission about money mindset and manifestation. We also hold weekly spaces for our collective to join forces and change the world. In each episode, you'll hear me moderate the conversation with my two co-hosts, Rodrigo Bravo and Santiago Caceres. Through this podcast, we hope that you will learn, grow, and thrive with our collective. Now, here's a little bit more about this episode. I absolutely love this episode. It is one of my favorite conversations with an amazing community member, Denai, who is the head of the Amigos Club on a lot of different spaces. And we just get into the dynamics of people of color feeling worthy and whether this is something that we are brought up with or it's some baggage and trauma that we've just experienced throughout our lives that keeps coming back as an entrepreneur and as you move forward in your journey in life in general you're always going to have to remember that you are worthy of everything and anything that you ever wanted and that you ever dared to try to get it does not have to reflect on you if in your past someone made you feel like you weren't worthy i'm good i'm good very good. I'm excited to talk about this as well. I think it's really important. I'm worthy, damn it, right? We were talking about that earlier. So I'm I'm, I'm kind of uh, excited to see what other folks kind of interpret that. Uh, I was picking some folks in as well. And I think it's important to, you know, kind of kind of flesh this out a little bit and why there's a difference between, you know, a confident I'm worthy as opposed to a cocky I'm worthy. And I think that's a big clue. And especially among Latino households, uh, you know, well, I'll speak for my, my household as well, for, for sure. I definitely saw both versions where I saw my dad with his cockiness and his, you know, confidence were kind of one in the same, you know, and, and, um, and to his defense, though, that, that was more of a survival tactic more than anything, right? My father coming in over here as an immigrant, <clears throat> an undocumented, undocumented immigrant, and having to kind of assert his value. And so when he's talking about I'm worthy, damn it, you know, he, he had to do that to survive, you know? So I think, you know, the context for the way he approached that is completely different than the context and what we are probably going to approach it. But I think it's critical to kind of make that distinction because a lot of times we don't know the context of what people are going through. Uh, same thing, you know, with my personal experience, especially working in the government uh, sector. I know you worked in the government as well, Wendy. And I know Santiago now works in the corporate sector, as all three of us have. And sometimes because we are minorities in these fields and we're, <clears throat> we don't see a lot of reflection of who we are, we kind of have to take that extra step sometimes to kind of uh, reassure ourselves that we are worthy, that we are, that we do deserve what we have, you know. And I think we've spoken about this before, too, you know, destiny versus luck. And so uh, before we get too much into it, though, um, I'm excited to talk about it. Happy to welcome Santiago onto the stage as well. Santiago, how you doing today, bro? I'm good, bro. I'm good. And uh, thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, dude, I came in right at, at the perfect moment where you were saying that, um, you know, the whole story and, and people here, you know, you guys have heard me and, and say that. And one one instance that I remember, and uh, please, guys, let me know if I'm breaking up because I'm about to go through this tunnel. But, um, you know, I remember when I was, I believe I was 18 years old. Um, I had just finished up the year before I had finished up my, uh, my first campaign ever that I had worked for in, uh, for New York city council race. Not that I was running, but a, a, a friend of a friend. Um, and he had promised me a job in, in the New York city council after I graduated. And sure enough, that like, he came through and he actually gave me the job. So I remember the first time I, I told my mom, I was like, mommy, you know, vamos para, vamos para mi trabajo. Let's go to, let's go to city hall. And she goes. All right, cool. She thought she thought we were gonna go see like the exterior of the building, but by that point, by that time, I had like my my city hall ID. I had all my credentials, 
And I remember I was giving her a tour of the New York City, you know, City Hall and where the council chambers met and like the, the, the West Wing where the, where the mayor's at at that, at that time, it was Bloomberg. Um, and, you know, the whole time she's there, like very hesitant about going to like different rooms and stuff. And she's like, no, no, Santiago, no, no podemos. I'm like, mommy, um, yeah, we can go in there. I work in this building. I am an employee. Oh, no, pero no van a decir algo, mom, please. Este es mi lugar. This is, I'm, I'm, I'm worth it. You know, this is, I, I earned this, the, the right to be here because I'm an employee. It's okay. You know, I understand. Yes, we're immigrants. 10 years ago, we were, we were arriving to this country and now your son is working in the building. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, that's one thing that I've, I've always told, I've always, I've always imposed of my girls. Um, Hey, listen, no matter what building, what space, where you take, where you're taking up, um, in your future career, your future endeavors, know that you belong in those in, inside those doors. You've earned your place to be there and you act as such. So I love what you were saying earlier, man. Thanks. Ooh, Santiago Rodrigo, this is why you guys are my homies in this room. And welcome everyone who's just joining us. This is the Social Impact Level Up Club and we have real conversations here every week on Mondays and Wednesdays. Today is our Wednesday room, which is our Social Impact Entrepreneurs Collective. This is where we come together as a group of people who are trying to make social impact change in the world to help all of us have a support system. And today our conversation is about um, worthiness. And I titled it, I'm worthy, damn it, exactly for the reason that Rodrigo mentioned, because there is a sense sometimes where you could go to the entitlement way of thinking about worthy. And then there's other ways that we limit ourselves and think that we are not worthy enough. And that was part of the conversation I wanted to have today. And then Santiago, you tipped on another part of the conversation is when we are determining our worth by someone else's standards which I think also happens sometimes, which can lead to feelings of unworthiness and it can be really confusing to navigate. So those are some of the topics I wanted to talk about today. I will definitely share my um, experience in a minute. And I had an example that came up, uh, Santiago, as you were talking about related to my family. So I, I wanna explore the family thing as well. So, but I'll invite Denai to talk. Denai, hi, welcome. And do you have anything you wanna just share um, about this topic just as we get started with the conversation and then we'll kind of get deeper? Andy, um, great topic. I love this topic. I especially love uh, the fact that you brought up, you know, the difference between uh, what feeling worthy and, you know, feeling entitled. Um, I, so for me, uh, you know, I, I was, uh, so in, in, in the early part of my career, I was like the only Latina uh, in spaces like I would go to trade shows, you know, like uh, MarTech trade shows with 10,000 people. And there was not one more person that looked like me. So it was a very weird uphill battle, like, you know, in, well, uphill battle and internal battle, because I kept on to remind myself that I belong here. I earned my space here, you know, and as I went up through the trajectory of my career and I was always, if not the only woman, definitely the only Latina, right? Um, in many spaces and boardrooms and meetings and got everything. And every single time I would have to do a presentation, you know, whether it was to the board or to a client, uh, it was always this weird thing of, I know they're, you know, noticing <laughs> the elephant in the room, which is I'm the only woman or I'm the only Latina. Um, so it's been, it's been a battle. Like I've had to have that little, you know, inner voice always reminding me, you you belong here, you earned this spot. You worked really hard for it. You know, you have um, the skills that it takes. Like, you know, it's it's always, always been uh, something that I've struggled with. Um, you know, it got better through the years, especially as more women, especially Latina women, have gotten into tech and more tech in particular. But yeah, it's uh, it's definitely it's definitely a struggle. Oh man, and then Denai, you brought in the Latina thing, which is another conversation I wanted to have with us too. We might be here for like a day, y'all, because you got to unpack all of this stuff. So Rodrigo, let's start with where you started the conversation first with the, the entitlement versus being worthy. I think for me, 
I always struggled with feeling like I was worthy because I would try to over perfectionist my way out of my unworthiness. <laughs> and what I mean by that is I would take the ultimate perfectionist route of doing everything I possibly could to the T and hope that I would be worthy of everything that I needed, right? And it was, you know, whether that was money or, or moving up in the world or like whatever it was that I was trying to accomplish at the moment. And I think from a, a young age, even in high school, I can remember this pattern of over perfectionism with the hopes of being recognized, seen, you know, patted on the back, patted on the head, like whatever it was that I was craving. And it had nothing to do with my parents or my mom and, you know, not giving me enough attention. I think what it really had to do with was trying to overcome the things that Denai was talking about, all of the barriers of you know, being a Latina, not being expected to go to college, not being expected to, um, you know, go and have a career versus having a family and, um, you know, getting um, pregnant very young, like most of the people in my family. So it was very much battling uphill the family history and other things. And my way to do that was this perfectionist piece. And some of that worthiness issue that I had with nothing to do with um, necessarily my family itself, but more the social economic status of my family, which I always felt like um, was, you know, not high enough or was, you know, something to be ashamed of or whatever. And it took me a long time to recognize that one, a lot of people live in working class poverty, that that was not something to be ashamed of, and it, nor was it something to feel unworthy of. And when you look at it from that perspective, there are a lot of people who are trying to overcome. And it's really sad that we have to put that much effort in being perfect in order to do that, in order to get past those barriers and in order to get to the next level. And when you get there, I don't think it's a feeling of entitlement, but I think that there is a sense of being like, okay, I'm not going back. <laughs> like I got this far, I will keep going and I'm not going back. And I don't, at least for me, take it as entitlement. I take it as, no, no, I, I've gone through the mess. I've gone through the work. I've done a bunch of the healing work. I've done a bunch of the work work. Like I've done a bunch of things. So yes, I'm definitely worthy of being in this place. And I think that the confident worthy is where I'm striving for. And I'm also striving for the authenticity for that not to look like cockiness. So I hope that that makes sense. And if anybody wants to jump in, it's just going to be a popcorn sale today. I'm going to invite some more folks up to this stage. But we're talking about worthiness. And right now we're kind of unpacking the unworthiness, worthiness slash entitlement um, debacle. Yeah, I, I love what you said, Wendy, because it is a stark contrast to my upbringing. And it just goes to show how wide the spectrum is on our experiences, because uh, as you said yourself, you know, you didn't really have that issue of your parents not giving you the, you know, the structure and really the validation to feel the way you felt, you know. And I had this very bizarre, I don't really even think it's that bizarre, but for me, it was bizarre at the time. And now, you know, going through my mental health journey, I understand how, uh, how, how strange it was where my father publicly would would just you know tell folks like oh yeah he's he's a badass and of course he is he's a bravo and no he's a macho he's you know this and that and i i almost fell into that whole you know kind of machismo kind of puffing out my chest because i am a guy and i was very successful scholastically and doing all this but then at the same time my father would always say like hey you haven't made it yet no, you, you, you know, you, you need to do this now and always moving the goalposts for me and not giving me the true validation that I really needed. So going forward, I always felt like I always had to work hard. And even though I would give validation for my peers, my 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 uh, my uh, colleagues, uh, folks that I went to school with, my professors and everything, I always felt like it wasn't enough. And so for me, I was always struggling with that. And so there was a constant push and pull of okay, you're doing great. Can I, can I, do I feel better by myself? No. Okay. Now I feel better by myself, but is it for the right reasons? I don't know. And it's just a constant kind of um, a push, push and pull internally for myself, especially dealing with my father again, who was, you know, surviving, right? So the, the things that he learned, the things that he put in place, you know, I can't really fault him for that because that's what he had to do to overcome the, the battles and the dynamics he was facing, uh, you know, however, he kind of threw that on me sometimes, you know, and so then I was battling things that I didn't even, I wasn't even aware of at that time. Uh, 
So anyways, I'll bring it all back together by saying this. A lot of times when we do go out there and we are worthy, we always find a way to kind of shortchange our own success. And I feel like, especially among us minorities and especially among women, Latino women and black women, I feel like, you know, a lot of times they, they're so much constant struggle against the systems that are in place that it naturally leads them to believe like, man, maybe it's my fault, you know, and, and, it, is, and it isn't until, you know, uh, uh, there's some validation, there's some healing, some, you know, processing of that trauma that, fo you know, folks that are suffering through that can really finally kind of break free of that and convert that validation into true validation, not just supposed validation or validation built on a structure that's really not true. And so I think that that's really where it all kind of comes together and where your story, my story, the nice story, Santiago, and a lot of folks that are in the audience right now, they probably understand and maybe have even gone through that because we do have to struggle with that and because we struggle with that, we don't know if the victories that we have are truly owned by us and if they really are our victories. Yeah, thanks, Rodrigo. Santiago or Denai, do you guys want to chime in? Yeah, Man. go ahead, Denai. <laughs> no, go ahead, Santiago. Ladies first, ladies turn. first, was... ladies first, ladies first. Oh, how much time do we have? Um, you know, it's interesting because as you guys are talking about you got validation or not from your parents, um, you know, I got zero validation. Uh, growing up, it was my brother was El Principe and, you know, I was the girl. <laughs> That's it. I was the girl. Uh, and so no matter how hard I tried, did I kill myself to get validation from my dad? He was the one that I always wanted validation from. Um, I just couldn't get it, right? No matter how many awards I brought home from school, whatever accolades I could get, uh, I didn't get them. And so, of course, that was my challenge to continue to work harder and harder and harder and do better. And kind of, you know, I totally, I totally um, uh, can relate with Wendy and the whole perfectionist thing. And then to layer on top of that, the fact that I have ADHD, so um, I was able to get away with not really, you know, working hard in grade school and then, you know, cramming for tests. Like all I had to do was read a book and, or read the, read the chapters that we were getting tested on, you know, 30 minutes before the test and then I'd ace the test and it was perfectly fine. But then, you know, college <laughs> wasn't quite like that. Um, and going into the workforce wasn't quite like that. So I had to work even harder to um, like establish very strict uh, rules for myself, schedules to make sure that, you know, I didn't wait till the last minute, you know, or, you know, how to, how to get snap myself back into being able to concentrate when I really couldn't concentrate. Um, so yeah, it, you know, I had that to layer on top of the whole not getting, um, you know, recognition uh, or an added girl or anything. Um, and it's funny because, you know, later on in life, uh, when my dad was much older and, you know, it was like about three years before he passed away, um, he finally gave me that added girl. He actually like looked at me and told me, you know, mija, te, tengo que decirte que has llegado, has, has hecho todo lo que tú has hecho sin que nadie te diera ni una cosa, ni una ayuda, ni hasta yo puedo reclamar que yo te ayude y tú has hecho todo lo que tú has hecho por ti misma y tienes que tener mucha... Eh, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the word, um, you know, that you have to be very, very proud of yourself because you did that, which was like mind blowing, uh, mind blowing moment for me. Um, but yeah, so, you know, like I said, how much time do we have? Uh, I can totally relate to the whole needing validation thing. It's so interesting to hear the levels of validation and where they come from or where they don't come from and the word, that words matter, especially from your parents in so many different ways. And just the the vibe that they create for you as you go through your life is so so much impact there. So I wanted to welcome um, Christina and Jacqueline. I'm going to go to Santiago real quick. Santiago, I know you wanted to jump in. So I'm going to go back to you. 
and then we'll welcome uh, Christina and Jacqueline to the stage. And um, if you're just joining us, this is I'm Worthy, damn it, and it's our room, our Wednesday room in the Social Impact Level Up Club. This is where we come together as a collective to talk about things that matter to us, us who are change agents and um, who are coming to Clubhouse to have meaningful conversations. So, Santiago, jump in, and then we'll go to Christina and Jacqueline. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I and I are like come from St. Paul because I I never got validation from my my dad. My mom was the one that, you know, she always respected the fact. Um, and actually after like high school, you know, I, I lived without a green card. I was here undocumented, but I accomplished so much for the time. I was able to join the service, but um, yeah, my, my dad, I mean, he's still like, you know, my brother's the, the prince of the family, you know, like he's, he can't get, he can't do no wrong, um, you know, so. I'm still looking for that validation, but at this point in time, it's like, for me, I'm not even looking for it actively. I just do what I do. Um, can you guys hear me? Because I'm getting the red bar. You're coming in and out. Oh, shit. All right. How about now? Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Awesome. Yeah. So now, it's, now you know, I kind of came to, to, to terms with, you know what, um, if, whether whether he ever validates me or not, it's all good. I know that what I'm doing as a, you know, in my career, um, there's only one person that I really just care about the validation. That's my daughter, you know, and as long as she sees the hard work um, and she appreciates everything I do, what she does, she's a very grateful kid. Um, that's what matters to me, you know? So in terms of, you know, looking for that, Hey, great job. And you know, that pat on the back, I'm like, whatever, if it ever comes, if it doesn't come, you know, I, I remember there was a movie called uh, boiler room back, back in the day that came out. I mean, it's not that I'm, you know, I mean, they were doing something illegally, but you know, there's a line there where Ben Affleck says, um, your parents don't like what, um, what they're doing. F you mom and dad and see how you see how they feel when you're making the Lexus payments, you know, who knows, maybe one day I show up to, to my parents' door and I give my dad his dream 1957 Chevy, you know, all hooked up and, Maybe I'll get that validation then, but um, my goal overall is to to provide that that college experience for my daughter without having her, you know, incur all these types of debts. So, you know, that for me alone will be the validation that I need. Awesome, Christina, go ahead and jump in. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing to myself. I wasn't going to come up at all. I was thinking about my story and trying to relate and then I'm like mm, it's different <laughs> it's different and then you invited me to come up and I'm like well maybe I'll come up um so uh I never needed um validation and I don't I, it's interesting uh to me and I don't know why and maybe um I had really supportive family but at the same time they did not really help me at all they didn't really support me it was just they were loving and caring, but they were never like, you can do it or you should study or anything. I was just always very intrinsically motivated. And I grew up in a community that was half Mexican and half white. And because I was so motivated myself, um, you know, I'm in the class with all the white kids because I was taking all the honors classes and AP classes. And then I felt um, kind of intrinsically motivated to prove myself that I could be just like I think all the other white kids and um, since I was the only brown one and it would always irritate me when they would talk about the Mexican kids as if I'm not there because they didn't look at me as Mexican they looked at me as white since I didn't have an accent and I didn't you know they just did not associate with me with that at all so it always used to annoy me I think that was my motivation um, but at the same time I remember um, I always wanted to be a mom. I'm from a long chain of mothers, uh, stay-at-home moms and caretakers. And that's really what I wanted in life. I wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. I wanted to take care of my kids. And I just wanted to be just as good of a mom as all the beautiful women before me. And I went to college um, on this scholarship from having such good grades and things and I remember being in the summer program for minorities and this program 
had everybody stand up and introduce themselves in the beginning of the program. And everybody would stand up and say, you had to announce who you are, what you wanted to be, and like your favorite toy growing up. And everybody was, it was a uh, sci science and engineering program. So everybody was saying, uh, hi, my name is Jack. I like Lincoln Logs. I want to build, you know, be an architect someday, or I love bridges, and I wanted to be, uh, you know, this um, civil engineer. And I stood up. And I said, well, my favorite toy was the one doll I had, and I really just want to be a mom someday. And that's what I want to do. But in order to be a stay-at-home mom, I know that I'm going to have to find a husband who's going to be able to take care of me. And that person's going to have to be smart. And I know that the smart boys are all around me right here. They're in college. They're getting their degree. So I hope to find my husband here. But if I can't, then I have a great backup plan because I will be able to have my own degree and take care of myself. And I sat down. And the, la the lady of the program, <laughs> she almost kicked me out. She pulled me out to the side. I remember, um, I don't know if it's relevant or not, but she was not Hispanic. Um, so I don't know if she not having the cultural relevance of of how deep rooted um, stay at home moms are in the Hispanic culture. But she was furious that she had somebody in her program that didn't want to get a degree. And I said, I never said I didn't want to get a degree. I said that you asked me what I wanted to be when I grow up and you asked me um, why I was here. And that is why I'm here, but I'm smart. And I'm like, oh, and after some research, she, she had no grounds to kick me out. I was an honor student. I was, I was getting straight A's. She watched me like a hawk and I still like was killing it in college and she had no reason to kick me out of the program. Um, it is with that speech that my, I met my husband and um, because he's, he came to me later on that day and was like, did you really mean what you said? And I said, I absolutely did. I would love to be a mom. And he said, you know, I've been, I really want that too. That's what I wanted, you know, but all the girls here, they all want a career. The girlfriend I have right now, she wants to be a doctor and she doesn't even want to have kids. And so we started talking and 20 years later and four kids, you know, that I, I was married to him for 13 years and it's, it's incredible. It's a funny story to me because I get to tell it and say, that's how I met my husband. Um, and he is wildly successful. I saw potential in him that he's amazing. He's a extreme entrepreneur. <laughs> he's also Latino. Um, and it's just, I as I tell my story, I'm just laughing at myself because here I am years later and I had to go back to what I originally wanted to be after I got my divorce. I went back to what do I really want to do with my life now that I should probably go back to work since I'm no longer going to be a stay at home mom since he's divorcing me and is no longer going to be supporting me. And here I am a parenting coach and I love what I do and it's truly my passion, but I don't think that a lot of people understand <laughs> the journey and my values and, 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 but all of it did come in intrinsically um, by just who I knew I needed to be someday. And my family to this day are, still don't understand what I do. They still don't see the value really in me being a parenting coach, like why I'm helping other people. They just know that I'm a good mom to my own four kids. And that just makes me think, okay, so yeah, I guess it really wasn't my family that really supported me along the way, but it's okay. I love my family. They're great people. <laughs> So Christina, Cortez, you've touched Cortez, on something. Cortez is a badass. Don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it, immediately when you said that, I thought, but she's a parenting coach. And what if she hadn't had that experience? And <laughs> she wouldn't be how much of an impactful parenting coach. So it's funny that you were saying the exact same thing um, in your experience as I was in my head. But it's like, well, who who's to say that that standard for yourself is wrong? And that was part of when we were doing our intros earlier that I was mentioning, we sometimes measure ourselves by other people's standards. And if you had absorbed her standard, how many headaches would that have caused for you? And I think that it was really awesome that you had the positive reinforcement of somebody coming up and saying, oh, 
I actually am interested in that too. And you had some compatibility of that person and could share years of your life with them. So that's a really amazing story of, you know, not having your worth determined by someone else. But in fact, you know, when somebody else who does see you worthy and you're seen by that person, how powerful that experience can be for you as well. So thank you for sharing. Jacqueline, hi, it's good to see you. Do you want to do a quick um, intro to what you're thinking and who you are? And um, yeah, come and share space with us. Thank you. Kind of the same as Christina. I was like just listening and I got invited up and I said, okay, I'll accept. <laughs> um, so I'm Jacqueline Valladares or Jackie Valladares. I go by Jackie. Um, and I am a senior program coordinator for a nonprofit that is centered around public safety and public health. Um, and this, so my worthiness, um, definitely has been, um, in the last like three years of my life, um, and really centering it briefly. I was an only child for like 13 years and I wanted to be perfect. I, want, I had perfect attendance. I had, um, I strive for perfection. And like, I remember in, um, in high school and in middle school, like I was striving for straight A's. I got the straight A's and I would tell my mom, look, like I have straight A's. And she would tell me that's your job. And so I, that, that was like a centering of me being perfect in college. I double majored. I triple minored. I had two jobs. I was a college athlete and I always strived to be perfect. And I think just recently in the last three years, I've learned that please, pleasing other people, having imposter experience, and um, I and listening to that voice of like, you can't do this, you know, I, I've ran 20 marathons, over 50 half marathons. And to this day, I still, if I line up in a race, I'm like, I'm not good enough. And then I, I like, do really good and then people are like you're so amazing you're so fast i kept up with you and so i'm learning i'm unlearning a lot of things too and i think with being diagnosed with um, anxiety and depression and um, ptsd i've learned to voice like and to be a mental health advocate um when i'm not feeling good um a lot of people want to paint the positive um toxic positivity and um uh, and sorry if i'm crying i've been having um a rough couple of days and so i i try to stay away from positive talk um pos sorry i can't even say it right now toxic positivity because it's not always easy you know there's an increase of suicide and things like that and when you feel seen and you feel heard and someone's not trying to tell you you know, I just hope you feel better um, is, is so much more helpful than someone saying, well, just think positive. It's like, you know, if I thought positive, it, I would have been like a seven years old when I had to see my dad be an alcoholic. Right. And it's like, no, like certain things I'm living with and um, I'm not perfect. And I hope people understand that and take me with um, my perfections and imperfections. And I think that's where I have voiced myself. And sometimes my, my mom or my dad, when I'm voicing my, my concerns are like, oh, here you go again. And it's like, no, I'm teaching you to respect when I'm setting boundaries. So that's all I had in my heart to share. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jackie, for being here. I, I love the idea of setting boundaries too with, with family members. And we had talked a little bit about family earlier. And so that's definitely part of the conversation. You can hear the layers of different interactions with family members throughout each of our shares. So thanks to everyone for being so candid about those experiences. I know sometimes unpacking that and coming with those those thoughts is, um, you know, something that you only share kind of in intimate spaces. And that's one of the things I love about our community and the way that we're building this collective is that we could have those kinds of powerful conversations. And Jackie always is the realist realist with the mental health conversation and so i'm really grateful for her to come and share space with us and talk about lived experience because sometimes when you are someone who whatever your experience is that you're sharing about and you know you might not feel that you're worthy to occupy the space and share that experience with other people and mental health is one of those issues that we often make people feel 
unseen on purpose because we're uncomfortable talking about talking about the topic. And I think it's important for us to be able to have vulnerable spaces and to support each other through that. So thank you, Jackie. And um, hugs and kisses from, from over here in Texas. I always love having you around. Um, so Sadija and Henry, welcome to the stage. I'm gonna reset really quickly. We're talking about I'm worthy, damn it, which has a lot of conversational tones to this mix. And we wanna make sure that you know everybody here has something to share, but we're keeping the conversation sort of on topic. So we went through talking about worthiness, unworthiness, feeling like you're entitled to things, family and their influence, um, feeling seen and unseen. And then we just kind of were talking about creating boundaries. And we also had mentioned some of the impact of be being a person of color and um, battling uphill and through different obstacles that have you know, maybe made you feel like you needed to be in a place of perfectionism in order to, to prove your worthiness. So that's a roundabout way of saying welcome to the stage and um, please share whatever you'd like to share with you, Jess. Hi, um, it's Sadiza. So this is my first time on Cold Call so hopefully y'all can hear me. Um, like maybe um, speak a little bit closer to your mic. It's a little muffled. Okay, good. Hopefully, is that a little better? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Thank you. So thank you, Wendy, and, and everyone for um, the conversation. And I just wanted to contribute really quickly. That I think you gave up. Yeah, it, it's pretty low for me, and it seems like she dropped out possibly as well. Uh, can everybody else hear? No, I think she might have cut out. No. Cool. Yeah, she's coming in really low. So, DJ, when you're... Hi, hi everyone. We're, we're going to go to Henry and we'll come back to you, girl. Just, um, yeah, see if you can get maybe a headset on or get closer to your mic. So, Henry, hey, go ahead and share. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I was just jumping in because I didn't know if, uh, yeah, if, if everyone else was, or if she was going to be able to get her sound back. I wanted to jump in on the boundaries thing i i recently read an amazing book because i struggle with that a lot also uh probably over the past two years um finally you know ha as a you know with a latino background never taught as you all probably can relate never really talked about some of this stuff and getting help on like mental health and stuff like that is has been like a really like life hack it's crazy like if, if, you know you learn so much um i've been learning so much but i i read a book recently is it was it was actually called boundaries and it was amazing if you guys you know are interested in taking a look at it it's from dr henry cloud and john townsend and it's boundaries not just like it's from family also bound work boundaries i struggle with both of those bad it, you know just a bunch of different spectrums so i just wanted to to share to share that just to kind of jump in quickly on that conversation um happy i'm happy to be here and, and just you know listen to you all yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the resource. It's always a great share when somebody has a book that's related to the topic. So appreciate that. So Sadija, are you back? I am. Can you hear me now? I can hear you better. What about Rodrigo? It's so funny. I didn't realize that when you get a phone call. So I'm learning this whole <laughs> whole setting here um, when it comes to Clubhouse. But basically, um, just sharing that, you know, the environment where I grew up in, I didn't have to question whether I was worthy or not, because most everybody there looked like me. We had very similar backgrounds. And when I left to go away to school, I went away to college in West Virginia. And it was quite the opposite, where no one or not many people there looked like me. And that was when I began to question and I experienced whether or not I was worthy to be in certain spaces. When I went to grad school, I was one of very few women, first of all, and then Black women um, in that space. And now as I you know, move into my career as an executive director in the nonprofit space, and I'm in boardrooms and other committee meetings, uh, I face that same challenge where I'm the only woman, or I'm the youngest um, woman, because I'm not you know, over 40 yet. And so either I'm the youngest woman, the youngest, the only Black woman, and so I began to question whether or not I'm worthy. And that's where I felt I had to start earning or like proving that I deserve to be where I was. But when I was growing up at home, I never had to have any of those conversations. My mom never had to reassure me that, you know, I was where I was supposed to be because I didn't question it because everybody looked like me. So I think, you know, once you leave your comfort zone in your environment, you're exposed to different levels and different things. And so I'm having that challenge as an adult versus as a child. 
Yeah, I, gosh, and, and it's so many layers into what you just said. Denai had mentioned that earlier about being in different spaces and needing to prove your worthiness. So I wanted to come back to that part of the conversation. I think it's important. And for me, I've had varied experiences with it. I would have definitely had the experience of feeling like I needed to prove that I um, needed to be at the table age-wise, not, not just woman and Latina and, um, you know, was my education good enough? But then also I looked too young to even be there at the table. And so worthiness sometimes is a pile of different things. And it could be any one of those factors that someone tries to pinpoint and make you feel like you're not worthy of being there. And when you battle that internally, and sometimes it does come up with imposter syndrome and it comes up with feeling like you're anxious about sharing or um, being in a space and really contributing in a meaningful way. Sometimes those feelings can prevent you from really thriving or going forward in a way that is the best for you and the best um, trajectory for you, for you in your career or your business. And one of the experiences that I had that was the complete flip of this is the other side of this where you get to humility because humility then is I think a part where you recognize that it's not that you're unworthy you're accepting that you're worthy but you're also accepting it with humility and being able to be grateful for what you are get, given and I think that sometimes that's the opposite of the cockiness as well and when I was in Africa years and years ago, I did my undergrad, I mean, my graduate school research in Africa. And I remember there's a tradition in Uganda where anytime you go to someone's home, they must give you a gift. It's just a hands down thing. And I would go to people's homes who had so much littler than I did. I mean, just so much less than I have ever had in my entire life and did not no poverty until I lived in Africa. And I would go to these people's homes and they would insist on giving me a gift. And sometimes it would just be a soda, which was still a lot for, for what I was, um, you know, just coming and being present at someone's house. And it took an extreme amount of humility to accept these gifts because I, one, didn't feel worthy of someone who had so little giving me anything of theirs. And two, I felt like I should be the one giving them gifts or giving them something um, because I had so much to be grateful for. And yet here I am, you know, struggling with this feeling of unworthiness. And I realized later that it wasn't that I wasn't worthy. It was that I needed to be there with them present in celebration and to be able to come to this space together and both feel worthy of each other's company. And that is very different from um, either one of us having a power imbalance either way. And so I wanted to bring that into the conversation, too, because I think that there's different levels of this, um, you know, other people and their influence on your worthiness um, when you're coming into spaces and culture and that piece of it as well. And then proving your worthiness versus sometimes feeling unworthy, even, um, you know, for a good a good reason when you're receiving something good. Um, so those are also on the mix. I'm going to open it up for anyone to popcorn style jump in. We have about 15 more minutes that we'll be here in the conversation. So if you're here with us and you want to come up to the stage, feel free to raise your hand. I will bring you up and just know that replays are on and we use this for a podcast. And anyone on the stage, feel free to chime in um, and share more. Yeah, you know, I just wanted to just kind of highlight again the struggles and kind of the uh, I, I'm not gonna lie. I was a, I was definitely a beneficiary of the uh, patriarchal kind of culture that is that resides there within my Latinidad, within my Mexicanness, really, because I definitely know that my sisters had a much more different experience than I did. Growing up, again, uh, scholastically, I was I was really good. I I I got really good grades, all that good stuff, right? And I know my sister did as well, but I know that at the end of the day, I was kind of celebrated. I was highlighted. Denai was talking about it earlier with her brother. You know, I, I definitely felt that and I understood that. And and so it, it was kind of, uh, I, I know when I was younger, I was definitely cocky. You know, I was definitely, it was an undeserved kind of feeling of confidence. And I knew that. And I, I feel, I, I remember even folks telling me that when I was in high school, like, you're full of yourself, you know, and this and that, or blah, blah, blah. But I always understood too that that for me, there was like, there was not only that expectation, but there was also that lack of validation from my dad. And that really did affect me. So it was kind of like a dual edged sword. But I have to acknowledge that at the end of the day, I do know that my sister, especially my the, the middle sister, I have two sisters, they're both younger than I. 
but my sister after me, now my youngest, she had it super tough because she did fall within that uh, mindset that my father and my mother had that, oh, no te preocupes, mija, you know, you're just going to get some kids and you'll find a guy and you'll be fine. And that lack of expectation and really that lack of, you know, motivation for her from my parents, expecting her to be really nothing was, was really damaging to her, I feel. Uh, as opposed to me having, you know, kind of deal with my my trauma. I, I have to admit, my experience, even as tough as my experience was for myself, was definitely not as hard as my sister. So I, I, I commend everybody here, the ladies, uh, you know, when it comes to Latina and black and black women and, and, and just the experience that they have to go through, um, you know, dealing with these kind of social constructs that we have, it, it's much tougher. It, it really is. Appreciate the recognition, Rodrigo. <laughs> it definitely is. All right. So anyone else want to jump in, Henry? Yeah, it's interesting, um, you know, talking about that. I, I was I was speaking to, I was catching up with an old coworker uh, from Chicago um, last weekend, actually, and she's a black woman. And we both found out that we um, kind of had a similar experience where and now, now that you mentioned the room, I'm worthy, damn it, uh, the, the, the title of the room name, where our families were kind of putting us down for being successful, like we were thinking we were good enough. So I had kind of like mentioned that I had been going through some of that, especially lately, because, um, you know, I, I've been doing pretty well with my career lately, and I, I've been kind of getting some of that from from our family, even, you know, you know, even we were talking about our parents, even kind of a little bit of that, like. And it's kind of, we were both like, she, she was like, oh my gosh, like my dad told me the same thing that I think I'm better than everyone. And, and we were both like, what do they want us to do? Like, you want us to stay, like, I thought our goal was to be the net, to be better, but, but it's like to a certain extent or, or what. And we were just talking about our experiences that way and, and how you just get to a certain point where you're at a certain level and you you know, your mind just expands so much that it's hard for your mind to go back down. And, and we appreciate and value everything that, you know, our families had, had done for us and contributed to us. Um, but we just also have to learn and accept that our, 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 you know, our brains where we're at are, are just different. Um, so I just wanted to share that because that, that kind of like sparked that experience that actually happened this past weekend. Oh, Henry, I mentioned that earlier when Santiago was sharing, and I forgot to, my story is exactly like yours. I was going to mention that too. So I have a cousin who did that, and he did it at my grandfather's funeral. And it was so completely appalling that I still get mad. I went to my grandfather's funeral, and he introduced me to his girlfriend. His cousin's much younger than me, probably like 12 years, 10 years maybe. And he said, oh, this is the cousin that left the family. And it was the same exact tone that you're talking about, as if, you know, me leaving the family to go be successful was a problem. And I looked at him and I said, no, it's not that I left the family, it's that you never come visit. And I mean, rightfully, a lot of my family does not leave California, but it, either way, it was so angering to me that he would phrase it to somebody like that in public, but also at my grandfather's funeral, that, you know, being bitter about or being upset about my success was something to slight me in an introduction to his girlfriend. And I think that you're right that sometimes it's not that our family wishes the best for us. I think that when you expand beyond what they're capable of being happy for you with um, the parameters that they've established in their head, it's difficult sometimes for you to get stuffed back into that box. And when you don't go back into that box, it creates a rift, it creates problems, it creates feelings of, of something for different folks, whether it's you or them. And a lot of the times, you know, you can walk away from that in a very negative space if the, if the interaction doesn't go right. And I think that, you know, that's the type of stuff that causes people to not talk to family members or to not keep interacting. Because then, you know, you don't want to keep having this conversation with this person or interactions where you walk away feeling unworthy. And that's not fair to you. And it's also just not a good interaction to have with a family member. So I completely agree that's happened to me as well. You know, when the... Um... That and that goes to the whole that I'm worth it. Damn it! That just because they think they're not worth it, you know, they have this expectation that the entire family should be that way. 
And that's, you know, I, I mean, I've been criticized for not, you know, I remember when I turned down the police job, you know, one of the, the my two biggest critics were my dad and my brother, like, what the hell are you doing? You know, you're, you're, you're leaving, you know, a good paying job on the table. Um, what else are you going to do? Like, like, as if being a cop was the only thing that I was qualified to do, the only thing that we were worthy enough to do. And I'm like, dude, I don't have to risk my life to make, you know, a hundred grand a year. I, I, I'm, you know, I'm getting an education. I made a lot more than a hundred grand without a green card. <laughs> Imagine now that I'm being, I'm a U.S. citizen, a veteran, and I have an education. So, you know, and, you know, I, I, I never stopped hearing it that, oh yeah, you know, and um, you would have job security, you would have this. And I go, dude, but I'm, I'm paving my way. You know, I'm never gonna, there is no ceiling for me to, to break through, you know, because as a police officer, you have that once, once you, you max out of wherever you're going to make, and you're doing a boatload of overtime, you're not going to make more than what you're already making. And on top of that, you're out there longer, you're exposing yourself more, you know, and it's unfortunate, you know, that they, they look at you like, I, you know, they, they, and it, they put that, I call it the Latino duck face where they, you know, they perk up the eyebrows and they do that thing with the lips, you know, when you're telling them that, Hey, this is, I want more out of life. So yeah, there's that huge thing where they criticize you and they look at you like, Oh, you're trying to be better than us. I'm like, no, what the hell's the whole point of the immigrant story? What the hell's the point of you bringing me here? If it's, if it's not going to be to strive for, to, to try to go after the potential that I know I'm capable of, not the potential that you think, um, I should pigeonhole myself in, in, which is get a steady job, risking life and, you know, make an X amount of money. So I, I'm glad you guys brought that up. He and said Latino true. duck face. <laughs> I just had to call that out. Love that. It, it's so traumatizing for, uh, you know, being so close to family. Like I, I, I talk about this with some people because I, I do see counselor and therapy and sometimes it's so easy for uh, the, the person that I speak to is 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 a as a white male and and you know it's so easy to say some stuff like you know it's just like family or you know but but I, I'm always like yeah but like that's everything to us like that was ingrained like literally into into my childhood was like you always you take care of the family and like you you know it, it was just so close it was such a important part to us and and. It can be, and and going back to what you said earlier, Wendy, if unless you get like the help or right support, is very very traumatizing. It was for me at least when I was, you know, still in my teens and hearing some of that. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that you are getting support. This is a good point too. So, DJ, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I I think going back to one, Wendy, I like how you worded um, the fact when he said you left and you said, no, you don't come to visit because <laughs> that's very similar for me. I was born and raised in the city of Philadelphia. And so while my family, because we're very small, they understand why I left and they're pretty supportive. A lot of my friends and the people I went to school with and those that I grew up with are like, oh, you, you know, you came from the hood, you left, you're too good for us now, you don't come back, you know, and, and I'm thinking, you know, much like what Santiago just said, like, that, that it's not the goal to never come back, but it is to be better than where we were. And, you know, you want to expand, you want to go and grow beyond, you know, where you were raised. And so the struggle there is just the mindset. And so I really like how you worded that. It's not that I left, you don't come visit. And no one from Philly really comes down here to visit me. So I, I really like the spin on that that you did. Thank you. Yeah. And Rodrigo knows I am not above a, a visit to the hood. <laughs> I, I will go to the hood and make and make a guest appearance and be there and hang out and do all the things. It's, I think that, you know, when you talk about choices and life choices for me, it was all about safety and, and moving away from a place that I didn't feel safe in order to thrive and feeling like I was worthy of making that choice. And so for me, it's not about, you know, why don't I live here anymore? It's also about you know, I can't afford to live in California. And if I did, I would not be able to live a life that I know I'm worthy of living. And so I have to make choices that allow me to live the life I want to live and to be happy. And that is what I'm worthy of. And essentially that means not being able to live in California. 
because I would live in extreme poverty if I did. So that's, um, you know, another just communication thing between my, me and my family is having to continually reinforce that fact and that decision because we have, you know, definitely had rifts over that point as well. So the last couple of minutes, I know we're going to close up the room. We might go a little bit over. That's okay. I just want to give folks space to, if anybody did want to come up, if you were inspired to still share, feel free to raise your hand. Otherwise, we'll turn hand raising off pretty soon. But if anybody has um, anything else they want to share, Denai, go for it. Hey, so I love what you just talked about with the whole hood thing and family calling you out because you had the nerve to, you know, go out and work hard and work your way up the socioeconomic ladder. Um, because I had that a lot, right? Where, you know, the, the whole, oye, te olvidaste de donde viene, I forget where you came from. And, you know, look at you living a fancy life. And I'm like, it, like, isn't that the whole purpose, right? Like our parents came over here, we could work and climb our way up the socioeconomic ladder and do better than they did. And then hopefully our kids can do better than we did. And, you know, building generational wealth and like, it, it, it blows me away that there's that thinking because it, there is, it's alive and well. I know in my family, um, you know, there's a, a portion of the family that, that does, that they feel like, you know, you turned your back on them and, and you got all fancy and you forgot where you came from. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's a whole like conversation right there. I don't know who else has experienced it. Um, you know, I see Wendy experienced it. I know I experienced it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's alive and well. And I think it's, uh, I, I think it's preposterous. I think it's the way of, you know, trying to bring you down to make themselves feel better about where they are. Um, I don't know. I don't know, but I know that it's alive and well, and, and, and that whole frame of thinking just absolutely blows me away. Now that you've joined our community by listening to this podcast episode, I want to welcome you to participate in a conversation with our collective very soon. If you're not on the Clubhouse app, you can connect to me on any social media platform as Wendy Veloz, V-E-L-O-Z. I'd like to thank everyone in our community who participated in this episode, and especially my partners in crime, Santiago and Rodrigo. Until next episode, keep changing the world.